Today we got man like Nels. Mm -hmm. How you doing? I'm very blessed, my bro. How are you? Yeah, I'm good, man. I'm good. Come on. Good to see you. Come on. Um, we can start with your socials. Mm -hmm. So any socials, just type in man like Nels uh, and you get to see the work that we've been building over the years. Come on. You get me? It's been a long road. We just crossed the 11 year mark now. Wow. You get me? So man's overly blessed to be making a living from what I consider to be a passion still. Yeah, that's good, man. Mm. So you say 11 years, is that 11 years music? So I'd say 11 years professionally. Okay, right, right. Music-wise, right. I started much younger. Um, I started music at age seven, by just playing the piano, you wow. know, um, singing in church. You know, real, every brother <laughs> started in church. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then eventually you find your way, you get me? But um, yeah, man, and then at age... So basically from age eight, this is when I began to take uh, piano lessons professionally uh, from a place called the Conservatoire, which is where you learn how to play the piano classically. What, what does that mean? Uh, it's, I mean, I, I don't think it has a word in English, okay, but I right, think it's right. the conserva Conservatoire. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what you guys call... But it's, where, it's where you go to learn music. Classically. Oh, classical so music. So learn how okay, to right, play right. music and all of that. Yeah, nice, nice. Yeah, nice. Man, yeah, man. So why why piano? Um, so the story actually behind how I got into playing the piano is um, a very profound one. It's kind of like I had focusing problems as a child. All right. Uh, so I used to just be everywhere, like um, a lot of energy and just very hyperactive. Mm. And uh, my mom went to see, uh, they're called a psychometrician. So it's, uh, it's the people that analyze behavior especially in children, mm -hmm. right? Um, and what the woman said to my mum was that the key to me developing more focus would be to teach me an, ac an activity which would enable me to do that. Wow. And piano literally did that for me. So it enabled me to find focus. Yeah. But then afterwards, it enabled me to like find more than a career, a way of life. You know what I'm saying? So that's, that's, really, that's really the story of how I got into music is... It it's, it's actually something that I then went on to find out at university that this is what piano actually does, mm. you know, for children, any children that might not have the capacity to focus or the capacity to contain the energy, a thing that's highly recommended is to learn a musical instrument. Okay, right, right. Absolutely. So I, Especially I, yeah. if, if you can somehow not get bored through the long process yeah yeah it's yeah. definitely a learning process it's a learning yeah. process it takes a lot of patience yeah yeah no I've, mm -hmm. I've heard that obviously you know if your child's active put them into something mm -hmm. but i never thought musical i thought like you know like kickboxing or fighting or something like that yeah or... yeah that, that's also good because obviously you're teaching them combat and yeah. combat sports are very important because it's uh it's a skill to be in possession of, you know, like we live in a cold world, man. <laughs> <laughs> London, <yeah. laughs> So it's also something to put your child in. No, it's true. It's true. Mm -hmm. So if we're painting the picture here now, so it's like seven, eight years old, right? Mm -hmm. um, where, where did you grow up? So I grew up in the southeast of Paris. Okay, nice. Uh, in a suburb called Le Mais sur seine Okay, okay. And uh, it's in basically the biggest borough in South Paris. Mm. So see how, for example, right now we're in a borough of London is yeah. the equivalent. It's about 40 minutes from the Eiffel Tower or the city or all of the big stuff in the middle of the city. Okay, right. And what, what yeah. was it like growing up there? So France um, is a very diverse country in terms of like yeah. what we know to be the population, right? Uh, a lot of the population in France happens to be the ex-colonies, right? Mm. So you might get some people from Senegal, some people from Mali, people from Congo, Central Africa, the country I'm from. Uh, you might get people from North Africa, mm. right? So a lot of Algerians, Moroccans, um, a lot of Tunisians as well. And we just all mixed up in this bubble that um, one of the old president at the time, Jacques Chirac, called La France Arc-en-Ciel, which is basically the rainbow France, yeah. right? As a, as a representation of all the colors that you'll find uh, right. in modern day France. Now, what's interesting about the point that I'm making now is that what the experience happens to be for a lot of people like myself, 
who are African descendants born in France, on paper, we are French, mm -hmm. but our experience on a day to day mm. reminds us that we're not. All right. You're wow. with me. Yeah. So um, the first time I got stopped and searched, I was 11. Wow. And uh, I was on my way to picking up my mom from the station because she, funny enough, she came to check out London, right? All she right. came to, she literally <laughs> just, um, so she, she came to, I think the station here is King's Cross St. Pancras, right? Yeah, yeah. Because that's the train that leads you to Gare du Nord in France, right? Yeah. And um, so, yeah, so she came back from London uh, ready to tell us if London was going to be the place where we would move to. Okay. So as I'm on my way to pick her up, I got stopped and searched by wow. the police, uh, strictly based on my appearance, yeah. right? And uh, I remember the way I felt at the time. It was an immediate icebreaker, an immediate realization that I am who I am mm -hmm. and they are who they are. There's, there's no two ways about it. There's no question marks. Um, and also the, because the, the, the feeling itself is a realization that there's loads of people around, mm -hmm. right? But out of everybody that's around, you're the one that's being picked. Yep. And um, it, was, it was just extremely crystal clear that, okay, there's a profile and there's a, um, there's a process, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, in terms of growing up, my personal experience, I would say because of the community feel that uh, you develop anywhere where people are in a situation of, uh, let's say, a coping situation, you develop bonds and relationships with people that you can relate to, you know? Mm. Um, so there was definitely a community spirit that I grew up with. Nice. There was a sense of respect for the oldest in the area. Uh, and there was, uh, above all, I would say something that kept all of us together. I'd say football. The football culture in Paris. It's quite big. Is, I mean, the football culture in England is also quite big, right? But the, the football culture in Paris is immense. Yeah. And it's really what determined a lot of my... A lot of the a lot of the ways in which I decided to spend my time. I see. I yeah. see. Yeah. Yeah. So you're 11 now. Mm -hmm. You get stopped and searched. Uh huh. What, what was the reason? What did, did they did they say anything or? So there was literally no reason other than the fact that for an 11 year old I was quite tall, quite wow. big. I've I've always it's only in my adult life that I stopped growing. So yeah, the growth spurt. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 So I've always been the tallest in my class throughout my whole life. Okay. Uh, even when I came to England, or if I wasn't the tallest, I was amongst the tallest in the class. Yeah. Right? Um, so, supposedly, I literally, uh, uh, I fit the description. I think, oh, I think oh, that's oh. the term that is yeah. uh, used. Yeah, that generic right? excuse. The yeah. generic excuse. You fit the description. Mm -hmm. uh, and I remember, for the first time, experiencing a feeling uh, of not having a way out of what someone had determined would happen in the instant or in the moment. I see. Yeah. Right? And obviously, as an 11-year-old, you don't have any identification with you. Yeah. Because you're 11. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All yeah. I had was, um, I had my mum's credit cards and, well, credit and debit cards, because obviously, as she wasn't around, yeah. I have to be the one... You get me doing the looking after and that. Oh, were you at home by yourself? Or yeah, with, bro. I with, was, but I, it was me and my younger brother. Okay, right, right, right. So another aspect of culture that perhaps uh, not a lot of people might be aware of, uh, you're, when you're in this coping situation, you're mm -hmm. kind of forced to face situations earlier than a lot of people that might be in a position of privilege. Mm. Uh, you've got to step up you've got to step up yeah and and you kind of step into manhood as a boy i see yeah <laughs> do you see what i'm saying so yeah so what when i got stopped in search i had my mum's cards on me and obviously the, the name on the card is a feminine name it's not my name yeah so the policemen are now looking at me as if i teeth the thing they did fraud you know, like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and i'm like no nah, like, that's that's my mum's cards yeah. i'm here to pick up my mum right i'm, I'm complying to what they're telling me to do, because obviously at the time, there's kind of like a sense of powerlessness yep. uh, in the situation. Um, so yeah, so, so it's, it was um, a very uh, eye-opening experience. I can and imagine. From that moment, I 
stopped living in dreamland. Because I think that's often the situation that you have over here in the West when it comes to African descendants or immigrants in general. We, we have to understand what reality is and we have to position ourselves in regards to what we believe reality to be. So from the moment I got stopped in search at 11, I knew what time it was. I was like, bro, this ain't your place. Just move accordingly. You don't have to be depressed about it. Mm. You just know what time it is. So you kind of accepted it the, and the realization of what it was? Absolutely. Being, being the young black man in, in Paris? Absolutely, bro. <clears throat> Absolutely. Wow. And uh, the, the reality of the delinquents in Paris that leads to those stereotypes and those um, unrequired stopped and searchers or those unrequired kind of putting everyone in the same box is, is, is a big conversation that I don't think the French government is having, yeah. right? What's that, the real source of the delinquents? You know, the delinquents is only just a, a, a reflection of the children not being, and again, you know, the conversation started over focus, right? So it's, it's the children not being focused mm -hmm. uh, in a, um, in what I like to call positive distractions, yep. you know, um, everyone requires entertainment or everyone requires perhaps, perhaps downtime or, um, or just moments to chill. Yeah, yeah, Not yeah. everything has to be serious, but when you distract yourself, you should be distracted by positive activities. Yep. You know, negative activities can only lead you to negative actions. Mm -hmm. And that's what ha has enhanced the delinquents that you see in Paris. The very reason why we moved out of Paris, actually. Yeah. Right. Um, my... Oh, so it was happening from back then. Is so it... yeah, yeah. Like <clears throat> what? What kind of things? Just so you... um, the the tower block culture. Yeah. Or the the understanding of societal structure. So you start in the middle of the city. You've got all of the expensive bits mm -hmm. and it's kind of like, you know, in those movies when they classify areas by zones, right? So yep. if you remember uh, the movie Time uh, with Justin Timberlake, yep. right? It's like the, the center is zone one and then the more zones you come away from zone one, the more ghetto it is. It's literally the same reality. Damn. So yeah. it's, it's quite literally <laughs> the same reality. So um, when you're finding yourself, let's say in zone five or zone six, this is when, as opposed to, uh, let's say, nice houses, you've got tower blocks where you park the single mothers with the children uh, and you kind of like uh, find this mirroring situations within families, mm. right? So in my case, we grew up with a single mom, two boys, 1994, 1997. Uh, and this was a situation which would be mirrored in a lot of families within the tower block, right? So, so it's almost like they group them together. Is that it's almost like say? they yeah. group them together. Yeah. Okay, exactly. Right. And uh, so what you find with tower block culture, just the way that it is anywhere in the world, mm -hmm. that's what enables the delinquents to start. You know, there's, there's no supervision. Uh, there's no cameras. It's just mind how you go, really. If, if you're not about this life, you've got to mind your way. Yeah, of Because course. trouble could come to find you. Right? Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So you find that there's various groups of youngsters doing what they're doing, whether it is to get by or whether it's peer pressure that got them into it. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a mix that could mean that even if you're not affiliated with that lifestyle, danger could come to find you. Yeah. And the reason why we left Paris is because uh, when I was on the way to be 12, so between 11 and 12. Mm -hmm. Obviously, this is kind of when you shift from secondary school to, uh, not from primary school to secondary school. And the secondary school where we're supposed to go to, a young boy had brought a gun to school. Damn. Right? And what, the, what age were you then? So, yes, yeah, so this would have, because obviously I left France at age 12. So this would have been, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the story would have happened when I was 11. Yeah. Um, and the story just went all around the town, especially the neighborhoods that was involved with, you know, sending the children to that secondary school. Yeah. So uh, my mum finding out about it, she was like, no way, no way. I've, yeah. I've seen many situations, but my boys, me and my younger brother, they're not going to go to a school where there's such amounts of danger because I could lose them. Yeah, it's, it's as simple as that. 
So she's now looking for a way out. And obviously, it was part driven by logic and part driven by emotion. Mm -hmm. uh, she just thought out of the box. She's like, let me try London. She literally just All right, on random. some adventurous <laughs> thing. No, it's, it's, it's quite incredible to like even say out loud. Like she just said, I'm going to go to London and see what's up. Yeah. So she, like I said to you earlier, so she came to London and uh, she met a few people and then she understood the system, how the housing system functioned with very little English. Oh. And she just made it happen. So she, she came back to Paris, obviously, after I had the situation with the feds and that. And uh, <laughs> yeah, she just emptied out her savings and we came to England. Did that help then when you told her, you know, I got stopped and searched? Um, so I think it didn't surprise her. Yep. Because also, you know, she, in terms of the job that she was doing in France, she was working for the government um, All right. at the, um, like a housing association thing mm -hmm. where she would understand family situations uh, and do the accounting, all of that sort of council slash housing association jazz. Um, so yeah, so she would under she was very clued up yeah. in terms of what the atmosphere in France is really like. Yeah. Fair enough, because you can see it for, at work. You can well, see yeah. it, like, literally bird's eye view. She yeah. has an, an understanding of what's happening for different families, uh, different uh, income streams for families as well. So yeah, so she knew, she knew what time it was. Have, have you been back to France since? Yes, I have. Uh, I still got families there. Nice, yeah. Um, so my, my dad still lives there with my, my sisters, uh, yeah. my aunts. Yeah, um, loads of family members, whether that's in Paris or Lyon, in many different places. Yeah, yeah. All right, so you've been back to France over what the last couple of years, and you go back often, then, right? Yeah, yeah, I go back often yeah. as well because, in terms of going back to the country of my origin, which is the Republic of Central Africa, yeah, this is where the embassy is. The embassy is in the uh, center of Paris. All right. So when I have to go um, to Central Africa until I get my passport done, because obviously it's just my birthright to get a passport done from the country of my origin, mm -hmm. but until I do that, I've got to get a visa from um, from Paris. Do you have to travel there or can you kind of get it before? So I can get it beforehand, yeah. but I just use it as a good excuse to go to France. Oh, to go back, okay. And yeah. see the family, see the friends and just see what's up, man. Because France, like I said, the, the, in terms of how the institution is set and how the, how the narrative is set, there's nothing I can do about that. But in mm -hmm. terms of how the community is and how the people them are, do you know what I mean? It's, 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 close, to, it's close to the heart still. Fair enough. What, what is worse right now for like crime and, you know, raising up kids? Is it London or, or Paris or France? So, in your opinion, I would say that we got to a dystopian reality in both countries. I had the chance to also travel to Sweden and I seen some situations in Sweden that made me realize that delinquents perhaps might just be a European problem. Oh, right, I see, yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> it, might, it, might be, it, might, it might actually be a situation which is rooted within the way culture occurs. Yeah. Because in my opinion, it benefits many individuals. Uh, mm. And you're looking at a, a culture which promotes capitalism, mm -hmm. right? And uh, thrives of consumerism. So crime is definitely an aspect of the equation which is required for individuals who benefit from capitalism and consumerism to uh, enforce, right? I had the privilege of meeting a woman who served as a judge in England for 25 years. Mm -hmm. And she looked me dead in my eyes like you're doing right now, telling me that, Nels, why wouldn't people turn to crime? And this is her wow. take after 25 years of serving as a judge. Another reality check for me, another slap in the face, which indicated that our perception of crime is not what it really is. Yeah. You know, it's designed to make individuals fall in that trap. Because, of course, if you end up in prison, you're literally where the government wants you to be. They can benefit of you being there. I see, yeah. yeah. Whilst, obviously, you and the members of your family, your friends you won't benefit from you being there. You what's know, what's, what's be... the benefit for kind of government? So prison is a business, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I'm not sure if you was aware, but perhaps you're not. Basically, when you work in prison, because to occupy yourself in prison, you have to work, mm -hmm. right? You're not just going to be chilling in your cell and just hitting the gym 
Obviously, we see the man them looking hench in prison. And, uh, <laughs> obviously, they do that. They do get hench. But you also have to work in prison. Mm -hmm. Now, the work that you do in prison, you're paid very little money for. Cheap labour. Cheap labour, mm. which is another word for modern day slavery. Mm -hmm. Because the work that you do produce in prison is utilised outside of the prison. Meaning that the time that you've exchanged in order to get paid, right? Because this is how they trick us, right? They say, give us some time, we'll give you value in instead of your time. Yeah. That time that you've invested is imbalanced with the money that you're being paid for. So it's a clear indication that someone is benefiting from that system. Mm. Yeah. Fair enough. That's a good answer. You're with me. <laughs> I'm with you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I've seen a lot of things to do with France and mm. I'd say majority is Paris because Paris, yeah. You know, Paris is kind of built up in, in this amazing light where we got the Eiffel Tower. Let's go. You got this, you got that. It, it looks luxurious. A lot Absolutely. of Americans, you know, want to travel there. Absolutely. You know, at least once in their lifetime. Absolutely. Bro. And there's a lot of posts now that do, you know, you know reality, mm -hmm. the, you know, Instagram and stuff like that. Excellent. And I'm seeing, you know, rats everywhere. Uh -huh. I'm seeing rubbish piled up. I'm uh -huh. seeing crime. Talk about the piss as well. Yeah, okay, okay, that, that too, yeah, 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 yeah. It smells like urine <laughs> in old buildings. Yeah. So, um, so what's the truth, man? Yeah, what's let's the truth? Go. So what you're looking at, France is, if not the master, I would say amongst the masters of a political concept called soft power. Mm. Now, soft power, as the name might indicate, is a way in which you apply power in a soft way. So for instance, if you was, let's say you're in a scenario where you have a man and you have a woman, the woman can apply power over the man or the man could apply power over that woman in a way that doesn't involve strength, mm. right? Strength is a way of showing power. But if you applied seduction, for instance, you're also uh, able to obtain the upper hand in a situation without actually using physical strength. So is it manipulation? Manipulation. Okay, manipulation right. goes inside soft power. And um, what you find is that France has presented itself to the world and built itself to the world as this wonderful image that you're referring to. Mm. So they've done it via the presentation of luxury, right? So you think of the world of fashion, right? You know, the, the, the biggest fashion companies are in France, Yep. You know, you think of Louis Vuitton, Chanel, Yves Saint Laurent, right? All, all of these uh, big names in the fashion world, right? Um, that obviously tend to work closely with the celebrities. So yep. they'll just send free clothes to celebrities, celebrities wear it. And now everyone who follows that celebrity is thinking that this is the way forth. And this is how to demonstrate that you're living a good life, mm -hmm. right? You're also looking at the romantic aspect of the conversation, right? The Eiffel Tower the French language, the French ideologies are often directly tied to an idea of romanticism, mm -hmm. right? That's true. Uh, and this has worked to France's favour because they can paint themselves in a certain limelight which does not reflect the true nature of their activities in and outside of the country. We can't forget that they have a firm involvement in the Afri on, on and in the African continent. Mm -hmm. um, in regards to political activities which reflect ultimate imbalance, right? <laughs> I, I could be a lot um, more harsh with my words. No, I get what you But mean. for the sake of diplomacy, <laughs> you know, it, yeah. it reflects ultimate imbalance. Um, and this is what you're literally looking at. You're looking at a country that has built its reputation using soft power uh, okay, in well, a manner that I don't know many countries to have done as well as France did. You know, so you're saying they're manipulating the media or thoughts and, you know, come to Paris is this luxurious place. But precisely. But then there's the truth. But then there's yeah. the truth. Okay, and the truth that you're going to find in France is a bunch of unanswered conversations. The awkward ones, the mm. harsh ones, the ones that reflect that uh, tyranny has occurred uh, and there's been uh, injustice which has been normalized. And now we have to deal with the consequences of that. Fair enough. Yeah. Is, it, is there enough representation of black people in France? So I think there is plenty of representation okay. of uh, black people mm -hmm. per se. 
Now, in terms of representation of African descendants expressing themselves yeah. uh, in a manner that does not adhere to the French ideology, this is where I would put the question mark. Because the way in which France expects you to conduct yourself, France would expect me to describe myself as a French citizen to you because I have a French passport. Yep. And France would expect me to conduct myself as a good French citizen who answers to the constitution and who behaves in a way where you attempt to whitewash yourself in order to fit into the mold which they um, present you with. You're really looking at a country imposing its realities on you. So the way in which power can be measured is by someone imposing a reality and other people adapting to that reality. Mm -hmm. So what you tend to find uh, on the French soil in terms of the African community, you find, or they say immigrants, but more specifically the African community, right. you find individuals who adapt themselves to that mold in order to survive. Because when oh, you make, okay. you with me? Yeah. So when you make obvious statements uh, of your Africanism, such as myself, obviously you can see my hair, mm -hmm. right? Um, that's going against what the mold wants you to do. The mold wants you to be as European uh, and as sophisticated French as can be. So for instance, if you was to adhere to that, you could land yourself a job as a TV presenter uh, on national television because you have excellent French and you conduct yourself as a uh, let's say a, a model French a citizen. modern French citizen yeah I see that's literally the idea so for individuals attempting to remain in touch with their culture in touch with their roots uh, life is difficult. made difficult it doesn't have to remain difficult mm -hmm. right because as long as you know what you're doing in regards to fighting the system you will find a way out like many people have right and uh, the perfect example of that, you're looking at the French football team, mm -hmm. right? So uh, the French football team that won the World Cup recently and also ended up in the final, eight out of 11 players are African descendants yep. and black-skinned African descendants, melanated African descendants, uh, which leads to a conversation where you have an individual by the name of Eric Zemmour who stands on national television claiming that this is a problem so we're literally bringing the gold back to France, mm -hmm. but it doesn't suffice for you to be considered a French citizen. So is he annoyed at the fact that, you know, it's the representation of the French team is just majority black? Absolutely. That's, that's what bothers him. That's precisely what bothers him. <clears throat> and hence the point that I'm making to you on paper, those individuals have qualified to now be so quote unquote French citizens, mm -hmm. right? And French Elite, you're elite, you're the best football. And football, we know what football is, right? I personally think it's the Roman circus. It's just a way to <laughs> distract us so that they can keep doing the madness. But we know what it does to our culture, right? Yeah. You're the elite of the elite, but you still do not... Or even if you, you do qualify, there's still question marks to do with your position. Do you black people mm -hmm. in France, in order to be successful, do you have to hide your, your roots and your heritage and your, and your, you know, your African culture? That's a great question. I'm going to answer your question with a real life experience that's happened to me. Yeah. As I mentioned at the start of this interview, we came to England when I was around age 12, right? So yeah. at this point, I've had my experience with government buildings and government representatives. Yeah. I came to England and the first time my mum, myself and my younger brother entered a council house building, you know, those council buildings where they work out the ways they can help single mothers and all the people that might be in need. Yep. I saw a woman behind the counter representing the British Council or the British government wearing the hijab. Wow. I had, I mean, I mean, you say wow, but to hear that's fairly common, isn't it? It is right? common here, yes. It's fairly yeah. common. So this blew my mind. It literally blew my, because in France, I had never seen a woman wearing mm. the hijab able to do her job or able to do a job. There's a concept in France called laïcité, 
which insinuates that everyone is on the one plane uh, field mm. and you got to leave religion aside, you got to leave beliefs aside, everything aside, and you're going to be here and you're going to be French, right? So when I'm here in England for the first time, more particularly in London, and I can see a woman practicing her Muslim beliefs and do her job properly because she has to deal with my family with limited English at the time, yep. it blew my mind away because I had never seen that in France. So from that point, you know, you, you coming in the country and seeing that, were you kind of just like, wow, this is maybe where I'm meant to be. This is an accepting well, place. Well, for sure. Obviously, England and London has its challenges as well. Yeah, yeah. But it definitely opened my perspective that there's a way for me. Mm. And, and time's gone to show that there was a way for me. I see. Yeah. Do you know what yeah. I mean? There's like, when I saw that, I was like, wow, there's a way. There's a way. And I might be dealing with some nonsense later on down the line. But if I can at least express my comprehension of my identity on a day to day, I can do this. No, definitely. I think, I think um, it's, it's fair to say London is very multicultural. Mm -hmm. And, it, and you know, there is, there is still racism, unfortunately, but it's mm -hmm. quite accepting. Absolutely. I believe, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And you have an opportunity if you're privileged enough to be away from the current nonsense and the current dystopian reality which we witness in the streets of London, you have an opportunity to make a way for yourself. I will mm. definitely say that. No, that's good. That's good. Yeah. So speaking about the, the hijab, mm -hmm. um, is that still banned in Paris, in France? As far as I'm concerned, yes. Wow. As far as I'm do you actually, Yeah, do you actually know what the reason is? So, France, uh, like, like I said, it functions of a political concept called laïcité, mm -hmm. which means that any concepts that you're attempting to bring into the way societal structure uh, conducts itself is not welcome, mm. right? You're, you're going to live in accordance to the, the idea of a plain uh, way to approach your French experience, right? So, like okay, I said, right. there's, there's a mode that represents the blue, white, red. You have to fit in that in order for you to do anything. Start by your language. I'm not sure if you know, but the French are very impatient with individuals who can't speak French. All right. As opposed to when I came here, I found that obviously you might get a little situations when some English people aren't so patient, but I found that there was a much higher level of patience for individuals who weren't fluent in English um, wow. in England. Oh, yeah, definitely. Much higher tolerance, even to the extent where I've seen people literally slow down the way they speak, mm -hmm. right? I remember there's a funny story that uh, always happens between me and my younger brother. My first experience with the English language was obviously when I'm moving my suitcases uh, in the bus trying to go to the, the house we was renting at the time. Yeah. Or the studio we was renting at the time, rather. Uh, the bus driver, obviously double deckers, is there pointing at me saying, all the bags, all the bags, all the bags. And I didn't hear him. <laughs> so I'm just like, what? I didn't hear the break. I'm like, <laughs> and then he slows down, all the bags, all the bags. I'm like, okay, cool. Because <laughs> cool. I'm translating, because obviously I'm fresh in English, right? So I'm translating the yeah. words he's saying with my basic understanding of English at the time in my mind, right? Um, but yeah, I've definitely found a higher level of tolerance for immigrants, even though it's not perfect, but yeah. there's a higher level of understanding. A bit more patience. Yeah. A bit more yeah. patience. How did you find adjusting to, because obviously everyone in England and London has different like accents as well. Mm -hmm. So how did you find adjusting to that? Was it, was it quite difficult? So for me, uh, what I found, and, and it's, it's good that we touch upon accents because mm -hmm. um, I have another story to give on camera. Yeah. that I've been given to everyone, but I've never actually said that to the public. All right. So as I came to England, uh, I joined the school system around age 12, age 13, right? Um, and obviously I still do now, but back then I had a very strong French accent. Mm -hmm. uh, and I never, ever got bullied for it in school, ever. And the reason why I have to say this out loud is because there was other immigrants who came into the school system at the time. And those immigrants came from Nigeria and other places in Africa. Yeah. And as opposed to me, I firsthand got to witness that 
a friend of mine who's now passed away, rest in peace, um, got bullied by the black community oh. because he sounded heavily African and Nigerian. But because my accent had like a, a European twang to it, remember I mentioned the romanticism at the start of this interview. Yep, yep. I'm a lot more welcomed in. And it's more like teasing rather than bullying. bullying. Yeah. I never got bullied for the way I sound. My close friends might take the piss out Easy, of me quickly, yeah. right? <laughs> and it's okay because it's part of life. If, you can't, if someone can't make a joke out of you, then I don't know who I've gone for you. Like, and you should be able to make a joke out of someone as well, yeah. right? But um, yeah, like I never witnessed that. Is that, is that going back to what you said about the, you know, the, what, how France paint the picture? 100%. Because obviously, I know it as like, the people call it the language of love, don't they? 100%. And it's a romantic accent, it's a Absolutely. romantic language. Absolutely. There's no other ways to put this. This, this is, I think the way in which people must look at France's power, uh, they, they have to consider that side. They have to really consider the way in which your mind portrays France mm. or the language or the people. You know, so for me, I'd say it was a more or less easy ride because it's a ride that even led to me not only expressing myself in English, also becoming an artist in English. Yeah. And regardless of the fact that I've got an accent in my music or in the way I talk, people still like what I do mm. and respect what I do. I've had many results that indicate that, you know, so this is what I'd say. I'd say that we've got to review the way in which we teach our children to accept straight um well Im i can't say strangers but i can say immigrants immigrant children in particular right because i know that bullying can affect people differently mm. you know not everybody's thick-skinned it's true you know yeah. so this is something to bear in mind no fair enough it's yeah. a good point it's a very good point mm -hmm. um do you think there's been a change then because obviously when when we were pray back in school yeah it was like you know um how do i put this was that Jamaican v African or, or yeah, it was or African people, you know, we're taking they make out their accents sometimes. Absolutely. And stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And now it's like um, you know, people have clutched onto African culture. That's very true. Uh, uh, what's your opinions on that? You know, so, African music, culture. Everything. No, no, absolutely. So this is the thing to understand about culture, right? Culture is to people what water is to fish. So humans need culture. Mm -hmm. There's there's no other ways to put this. Culture is the way in which we approach life. It's identity. Isn't it? Identity. The set of activities you do from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to bed. Now, this African culture which you're mentioning, Africa and Africans are not benefiting from its amplification. It's being utilized. Uh, it's being vultured, right? As Almost as a, a cool factor. Mm. So like Afrobeat comes on, and all of my co-workers that are not Africans are going to look at me like, hey, Nels, show us something. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? And yeah. it's kind of like, it's kind of like, it's, uh, it's almost like a pass to connect with African descendants or to benefit from African descendants in various ways, mm -hmm. right? So I know that African culture obtains more respect in terms of what it makes people feel, but I don't believe that it, enables Africa to be in the position where it should be in terms of ownership of that culture. I believe that we're the only culture which has normalized being exploited, right? Um, mm. I've never seen a white singer uh, in Bollywood, for instance, right? Perhaps it exists. I don't want to, you know, throw some words on the back of not having done my research. Yeah. But I've never personally seen a successful white singer utilizing Indian culture, which is a multi-billion dollar business, right? And making a career out of it. But we have seen many times white artists literally taking our thing and doing what they will <laughs> with it, you know? And sometimes that might even be an order, which sometimes, I'd even say most times, it's an order which comes from above. Right, mm -hmm. you might find yourself in record label situations where they tell their white artist, "Yeah, you've got to appeal to the black lot." <laughs> 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 do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So uh, it's uh, it's. Um... With, with that being said, then do mm -hmm. you think black people are kind of almost like a, a fetish, or seen as like cool or fetishized, or? Yeah, yeah, that also, that also. Um, 
I think, like I said, we as African descendants, whether mm. we are African descendants from Africa, as in directly from Africa, or whether we've been now taken to the islands, uh, you know, with the, the, the brothers in Jamaica, Grenada, and all of the other islands in the West Indies, um, we must work a way to put a stamp on ownership. Mm. I think this is the way in which we've been tricked in all aspects of our black experience. We've not understood the importance and the enforcement of ownership. And this is how we got got. Because now people can take our stuff, make money off of it, and leave us out the equation, right? Similar to how they can take African artifacts, place them in a British museum and call it a British property, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, same for, you know, in my country, there's, there's a certain artifacts that are now in Holland. And I recently found this out because a brother uh, from Central Africa connected with me and told me, yo, Adneli, uh, I'm not sure if you know, but the, uh, the artifact slash weapon that you had in your music video, uh, there's a version of that in Holland. And I said, what? And then, you know, we're finding out that more and more African artifacts are found all over Europe. Yep. Casually, with no consequences, no... Do you know what I mean? So I think mm -hmm. we, we must really stamp uh, us as this generation of information that we are, we must stamp ourselves in ownership. How do we do that though? Where, so, where do we start? So first of all, it begins with your comprehension of your, yourself, right? You, we must first, before we own um, external elements or... Uh, 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 attributes, mm -hmm. we must own ourselves fully because the way things are right now, a lot of us do not own their time, a lot of us do not own their ideas, mm -hmm. and a lot of us do not own their ambitions, right? You speak to a lot of African descendants, you ask them what they want out of life, and it sounds like a replica of what the colonizers told them to say. Mm. <laughs> do you see what I'm saying? <laughs> like, yeah, I want me a big house and yeah, maybe a wife that looks like this. And, you know what I'm saying? Okay, I see what you mean. You, you get what I'm saying? So yeah. you've got to begin by owning your own ideas uh, and owning uh, a sense of self, yeah. right? And, and for that, there's plenty of um, intelligence out there. There's so many black scholars who we can only be the, the echo of today, right? Once you've got an understanding of that, you will be in a better position to comprehend how to tackle the fight about ownership uh, in terms of external elements that belong to the African continent or belong to African descendants. Because the war in which we're in today is one where, it's one that's gonna require uh, articulation because that's how they keep us in captivity now. Mm -hmm. they, they will use a certain language to justify the draconian acts that they have put in place that have led them to now utilizing African property and Africans themselves. So Africans have got to be in a position where all of us have to be on code, right? If it's just mm -hmm. a few of us, then mm -hmm. we know what the outcome of that is gonna be. Somebody's gonna fight until they get murked. Is there enough unity? Uh, so that's, that's the point that I'm making. There's yeah. nowhere near enough unity. Okay, right. I think this is step number one, right? Uh, it's an understanding of unity and community. If we can't do the work on a uh, wider scale, let's begin on a smaller scale, right? So you begin with your family, mm -hmm. right? So you begin with your friends. Uh, and it, this is a very complex conversation to have anyway, because family and friends can be a quite touchy subject because of the layers found within that reality. But you begin with a process whereby You've got a groups of individuals who know exactly what time it is, right? Which can only happen through education. Education is the preparation for the proper handling of power. And that's John Henry Clark, yeah? A, <laughs> yeah. Um, a scholar that you must study as an African descendant because you will get a level of game which will open your own uh, understanding, your, which will open your mind to understand the situation, yeah. you know? So um, to obtain that unity, one must understand the importance of unity because right now we're all over the place with agendas where we want to answer our selfishness. And uh, this is why you've got chaos in our community now.
it's because it's, it's crabs trying to come out the, the bucket and uh, they'll do whatever to come out, including, you know, the Judas complex where we always hurt one another or even kill one another. I see. And, you know, so yeah. the education has to begin from young. That's Freddie Douglas, right? It's easier to build strong children than it is to repair broken men, mm. right? Uh, because children, their brain is like sponges. So in terms of what you can immediately do right now, you can immediately make sure that all the young brothers that you approach, you equip them with the right information to make sure that you turn them into men that are going to be on code. Because this is the problem that we have. We have a multitude of men who aren't on code. Are there enough black men role models mm. or, you know, young black men growing up? Mm. I believe that the major difference you and I witness, because I'm going to assume you're of my generation. Are you a 90s baby? I am, yeah, 94. Cool. 93? Yeah. So yeah. you're my older by one year. I'm 94. 94, can't I believe the major difference between our generation and the 2000 babies is that at some point, the role of the big brother disappeared. Mm, okay. That's, that's my personal belief. Can, can you expand on that a little? So yeah. until today, I have people that are not my blood brothers that I refer to when I speak to them on the phone as big bro. Yeah. And I take pride in that. I take pride in knowing that I have older men that have the capacity to check me when I'm tripping. Because yep. it's possible to trip. Like, I'm a very confident man in myself, in my abilities and what I can achieve and what I'm here to do. I'm very clear on what my purpose is. Yep. But regardless of that level of supremacy in self, it is definitely possible to get things wrong. And when I do get things wrong, I not only expect my people to check me, but I am thankful for the fact that people have got the capacity to do that and that I can take on criticism in a manner that will enable me to rebuild myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At some point, we have removed the position of the big bro who criticizes in order to edify the big bro, the father or whatever. And that's not just applicable to your family members. We've removed that out of the community. And now, supposedly, as a big bro, you can't check the youngsters like we could be checked when we was younger. Oh, so that gap's gone too big. The it's gap's gone too big. Right. Because now you might have a good intention and go and check the youngster, but he stabs you. Yeah, they, they see it as a, like, you're, yeah, you're undermining them. You're, Do you know what I'm saying? It's an ego you, you, thing, and, yeah. and you could literally approach the situation from a, let's even say, you shouldn't have to anyway, because in terms of, you know, you're older than the youngsters, so you know more things about life than ultimately than they do. Yeah. So when you're telling them, don't do that because you're going to end up here, you shouldn't yeah. have to make yourself smaller to do that. But let's even say you made yourself smaller to approach that youngster, you could still get stabbed or something bad could happen to you. It's true. You with me? We've yeah. removed the importance of the big brother in the community because I believe that this is what kept us in check, right? A lot of us grew up without father figures because we can't ignore the baby boom uh, of single mothers that happened for a lot of the 90s babies. Yeah. It also happened for the 80s babies, but I believe in the 90s, we've seen that really begin to expand. And what kept the young men uh, that made it out of the Maza uh, afloat was that there was other men out here. Yeah, no, it's true. It's out here. Like, until to, like I said, until today, mm -hmm. obviously I'm... I'm I'd I'll be, I'll be 30 in about a year and three months or so. Um, but even as someone who's about to enter, you know, the third level, as we call it, mm. I still got big bros right now. Yeah. Right now, like anything, obviously I keep myself in check in that, but anything, just one phone call. And they'll be like, okay, cool. Man's been there before. You get me a bit of guidance and that, you so know? That, so, you, so that guidance is missing from, from it's the younger generation. Most definitely missing. And another thing that you're witnessing is that in terms of representation of us in the media or on camera, a lot of us decide to shy away from a position whereby we uh, not only speak on those things, but also um, take accountability and responsibility for our position in the equation. So brothers and sisters might make it, Yep. And then instead of speaking out on certain situations, they will take the deal of an alcohol company being like, yeah, promote the alcohol. You know, we're going to get some nice lights and you're going to get that for life. And so now 
people with influence will promote alcohol brands, clothes, uh, ideologies. Oh, you wasn't at that party? Oh, you missed out? It was lit. Do you know what I'm saying? So you, you promote uh, concepts that represent frivolous. Mm. You do not promote concepts that represent longevity. Right? Is that a sellout? I think it's fair to say that. But that being said, um, I do understand that people are motivated by a lot of the things that they have gone through. And not everyone has developed the emotional intelligence required to detach yourself from strictly allowing trauma to be the driving factor in your life. So what do I mean by that? Let's say there was a point in your life you had no money, you was down and out and you was on the floor, kicked and beaten. Mm -hmm. It takes a certain type of mind to get up from this situation and not allow the situation only to be the driving factor of the reason why you do what you do. If you allow the fact that when you was down and out on the floor, people kicked you and treated you bad to lead you, ultimately, all you're going to seek to be is a rich capitalist who doesn't care about people. Mm. But if you've got the capacity to rise above that, rise above your lower nature, what you're going to start to do is things that are deeper than just answering uh, the needs of providing for yourself and protecting yourself. Yeah. So on paper, it's fair to say that when you're just out here promoting brands and partnership deals, you're selling out to the community. But I will also say that I empathize with brothers and sisters that have gone through the worst and have not managed to overcome that. You know, I think it's important that we show empathy to one another mm -hmm. because we know our reality to be what it is. There's certain things that I can speak to you about. I could never speak to someone outside of our community. I see. Do you see what I'm saying? No, no, I understand. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> no, I understand. Mm -hmm. um, I've got a random question. Uh -huh. do, do, do you think white people have culture? So, <clears throat> white culture, this is a brilliant question. You call it a random. I call it a brilliant <laughs> question, bro. Thank you. <laughs> so... I need to clarify um, that, first of all, people are people. So there's nothing wrong with white people, but there's everything wrong with white culture. Okay. So white mean? people do have a culture. Mm -hmm. Culture, like I said, is um, culture is to people where water is to fish, right? So water enables the fish to not only live, but also navigate, right? Okay. Yeah. So white culture normalizes the raping and exploitation of any other cultures and individuals who the individuals in charge of that culture set their eyes upon in order to guarantee that capitalism remains the conversation in charge of how human experience is conducted. Yeah? So every single aspect which you find within white culture fuel the ideology a lot of the times there are issues which hit us on an emotional level that cause various amounts of reactions out of people because those reactions are sparked by our emotions but a lot of those conversations have got nothing to do with our emotions but everything to do with a capitalistic business conversation so why culture normalizes exploitation of anything that it sets its eyes upon. So do you believe that white culture normalizes exploitation of other cultures? 100%. Other, other races? 100%. And is that for kind of everyone who's, who's white or, or the majority of white people or, or so what would it mean? Yeah. So the majority of white people are too separated from a um, lived reality by individuals who are the direct consequence of the application of white culture. So what do I mean by that? There's a very, uh, there's a viral video going around right now mm -hmm. of a white woman asking how are white people supposed to feel about all of these immigrants coming into Europe? So like uh, France, England, and people are losing their lives in the water. A lot of white people will be not only judgmental, but non-acceptant of the idea of immigrants risking their lives mm -hmm. 
to live here in Europe, literally risking their lives. There's no navigation system on the boat, nothing but God's grace that might land you on the other side. That's this true. is what immigrants are doing and dying. They're dying in the water. This has been demonstrated. Mm -hmm. But white people aren't even able to empathize with those humans because in the reality in which they live <clears throat> in, they never have to remotely consider why someone would do such a thing. To you and I is very obvious. Neo-colonialism uh, destroys the countries where it is applied, right? So the individuals leave that country hoping to find a better future or a place where they could actually live a day to day. Mm -hmm. Even if they never get to see the American dream or, you know, dream big and be ambitious and that, at least have a day to day experience which will enable you to be like, I'm alive. Mm -hmm. This is what people are looking for, <coughs> right? But a lot of. You hear me? Yeah. But a lot of white people can't even connect with that because in the reality created by white culture, ignorance has the developed power over their existence. So for us, to, that's why I said at the start of this point, you can't even be mad at white people. So, some of them take the piss, right? We can separate those individuals. But in terms of the, the majority of them, they are literally the children of amplified ignorance. And they... Because their reality is so comfortable and privileged, I don't, I personally don't think that they could ever have the capacity to comprehend what motivates individuals to do what they do, uh, in terms of, you know, perhaps immigration or perhaps, uh, reason why certain communities are marginalized and left aside and what that leads to cause, i.e. delinquents, right? Yeah. A lot of the time when the white people speak on delinquents, uh, is, is, uh, they'll describe the situation as they understand it, as opposed to overstanding it, mm -hmm. right? So me, when I talk on delinquents, I'll speak from someone that overstands it because I lived it firsthand. Uh, I've lost people to the street uh, and I've experienced a set of realities to do with delinquents. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. But someone that's never dealt with that, they just be like, oh, they're just a bunch of thugs, right? And they push them aside, right? So, so this is what to understand is that white culture normalizes the abnormal. And until we as people, meaning that individuals of all ethnicities address that, we are going to be under the power of that reality. Do they want to change? No. Okay. Of course they don't, because like I said, their reality involves detachment. Mm -hmm. I obviously seek for change. So is it, is it ignorance or is it... Turn, like, I don't want to know. Turning a blind eye. Yeah. Is it, is so, it, is it? it's, it's, a, it's definitely a bit of both. I, I say it begins from ignorance, but we're in the age of information today. Mm. I found out some information on YouTube, in books, in interviews, in podcasts, in all types of things yeah. that really widened the way in which I could consider human experience. So, in a way, nobody has excuses today because you could be at home and teach yourself computer science. <laughs> it's true. Do you see what I mean? You could literally be at home and teach yourself anything. So nobody has excuses in that sense. But like I said to you, there is no surprise, surprises, sorry, that they are detached from wanting a better future for humanity because their reality is significantly more comfortable than ours. Mm. <clears throat> is it? The fact that, do you think it's programmed that way? Because, for example, um, mm -hmm. right, so we've had Black History Month for mm -hmm. Lord knows how many years since we were kids, right? Absolutely. And I still think that, you know, they didn't teach the real Black History. They didn't of teach they didn't. everything that happened, mm -hmm. you know, how people died, the, the, you know, the journeys on the boats. Absolutely. What, what the slave masters did to Black people. They didn't uh -huh. teach any of that, uh -huh. you know, in, in depth. Absolutely. The origin of certain words. By yeah. the way, is this a platform where I can swear or should I keep no, it? No, it's up to you. Entirely free. Fuck okay, me. cool. Well, yeah. excuse my French, <laughs> <laughs> but terms like motherfucker okay. mm -hmm. have a clear uh, historical comprehension. Can, can you explain that for us? Yeah. So the term motherfucker comes from uh, an African man having to have sex with his mother mm -hmm. in order to produce more slaves. <laughs> this yeah. is uh, an they, actual, he was forced to do that forced to we, do that yeah, yeah. right this is an actual reality that we've now commodified in our day to day conversation it's used by African descendants and it's used by Europeans as well 
So, so to, to complement your point, there is a full in-depth comprehension of African history, let alone the history that is promoted, i.e. the stuff that's always going to make African descendants look bad, mm -hmm. but the glory of Africa as well, right? Mansa Musa, uh, Quinn and Zinga, uh, you know, Shaka Zulu. There's, their stories are not fully explored, mm -hmm. right? Even Queen of Sheba, like, I'm just giving you the obvious ones. I could give you some less obvious ones. Yeah. But um, their stories have not fully been explored, right? And like I said to you, it's by design because you've got to understand purpose and what we must get better at. We must detach ourselves from, our, from the way in which it makes us feel, right? We must understand it logically. Logically, we understand that white culture is designed to do that, to commodify it has to benefit capitalism. So how do you do that? You can modify. So if I give you a Black History Month every October, right? We know that October each year is going to be Black History Month and Halloween. Today's Halloween, right? Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? So it's like, this is what it is. In February, we've got Valentine's Day. Christmas, uh, so in, in December, we've got Christmas. In um, uh, April or March, I can't remember which month, we've got Easter. In October, we've got Black History Month. This is what it is. It's a commodified way of experiencing human, uh, human experience. You know? Right, so this, right. this, is how, this, is, this is how white culture functions. You commodify elements. Mm. So our entire history is condensed, right? Barely touched upon properly, right? There's individuals like Louis Latimer. Obviously, right now, we've got some lights in here. That's thanks to Louis Latimer. But everyone knows Thomas Edison. Nobody knows Louis Latimer. Mm -hmm. Do you with me? Yep. So this is what you do. You, it's, it's selective, you know, and commodified for the sole purpose of entering capitalism. Okay, right, right, yeah. right. <clears throat> Interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'm going to make a little switch now. Yeah, for sure, man. So you're, you're trilingual, right? For sure, I am. So that means you speak three languages? Three languages. And obviously English, you've spoken about French. Uh -huh. what's, what's the third one? Sango. <clears throat> Sorry. Sango, which is the language of Central Africa, the oh, language yes, of, yes. Um, of my ancestors. Central Africa is uh, one of the youngest countries in Africa, uh, yep. obtained its independence mm -hmm. in the 1960s, often known as the country of L'Empereur Bokassa, right? self-proclaimed emperor who was literally obsessed with Napoleon. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> like uh, one of the huge issues on the continent of Africa and a baby of colonization is that in terms of identity, a lot of Africans decide to identify outside of Africa, you know? All right. Of course. It's because, you know, you're, you're looking at a situation where colonial force comes to your country, stands in front of everyone and say, je vous déclare français, which translates to you and now declare you French, right? See, yeah. <laughs> which you quickly find to be a white lie, no pun intended. Uh, do you know what I mean? So it's... Um, yeah. It's a reality which shapes a lot of identities. And when you deal with extremism, uh, it can go really far, mm. really, really far. So, uh, you know, it's a country that has witnessed a lot of civil wars uh, due to uh, a political imbalance created by design, of course. The more and more research you do in African politics, the more you start to understand how it's done, right? It's done very very specifically, right? Often people tend to always point the finger at the African leaders, but I would like for individuals to, that make that statement to further their research and to find the nature of the relationship between those African leaders and the West. Because as of lately, we've had a lot of situation exposing the true nature of that relationship. You know, yeah, right. it's a phenomenon that occurs all across Africa, but more specifically in the French Africa. You know, you've got the soft power phenomenon created to paint a certain image of France, and you've got the nitty gritty actually practiced on the African continent, right? Which involves the exploitation uh, in all types of resources, diamonds, gold, petrol, um, and so on and so forth, let alone the minerals of the soil. There's that, <clears throat> there's that, um, I think it's a metal that goes in mobile phones and chips. Ah, uh -huh, coal tax. Is that right? Okay, Kotan. So yeah. Kotan is in Congo, which is the country just underneath Central Africa, mm. but also a country responsible for the creation of Central Africa, I would say. All right. Because uh, Central Africa being one of the youngest African countries, it's a hybrid of Africans, right? It's bordering with 
you know, Sudan, Congo, Cameroon, Chad, right? And these are much more ancient African countries, mm -hmm. right? So what would formulate the people of Central Africa is a hybrid between all of those Africans. I personally have Congolese in my family tree uh, as much as I have also uh, more like Chad slash South Sudanese uh, heritage as well, you know? But obviously it gets mixed, it gets mixed, it gets mixed. And now we, now what, we have what we call a hybrid of Africans, you know? Um, and yeah, the situation in Congo is uh, ultimately one that goes hand in hand with the point that I'm making about white culture. Yeah. You know, we, we idolize our villains, right? So Steve Jobs set the world free with the iPhone, iPad, iMac, right? And everyone, you know, you go to certain offices in London, you've got big pictures of Steve Jobs, right? Mm -hmm. But the part that never get spoken about is what that reality is synonymous of, right? Black pain, white joy. <laughs> you with me? Okay, right, right. Because... You don't get the iPhone revolution without the mineral in Congo, do you? Yeah, but saying that, would, would you, uh, you know, would people now go, you know, I, I'm, I don't want an iPhone because of that? So people <laughs> will not do that because of the level of uh, convenience the iPhone has brought to us and yeah. how far in we are and also how iPhone has basically, for a lot of us, deeper than iPhone, just I. Apple products uh, yeah. have created a lot of us. A lot of us are geniuses that function with Apple. Yeah. You know, I'm a record producer. I work with iMac uh, and I've not only made a living, but I've done so much thanks to my exploration of Apple products, mm -hmm. you know? So for me to now be like, okay, cool. I know that this is morally wrong. Therefore, and thereby I will detach myself. Ultimately, in the society that I'm in right now, um, I will fall behind. And there might not be a way back for me, mm -hmm. you know? So the reality is that the conversation's got to improve. We understand that we are attached to those products, but we've got to change the way in which uh, this operation occurs and the way in which Africa receives from such an involvement in the world. Mm -hmm. Without this exploitation, we're not where we are. So we've got to change that conversation immediately. Um, it's gonna, I don't know how to word this, but mm -hmm. are black people too welcoming into being exploited sometimes? I couldn't agree more. It's a question. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's a question that yeah, yeah, yeah. sounds like a statement. <laughs> you see what I mean? Um, way too welcoming yeah i gave right. you the example of the bollywood situation yeah perhaps our viewers or the people that listen to us might be able to correct me if this ever occurred mm -hmm. but i've personally never seen with my eyes uh a superstar of bollywood music who was a white person mm. i've never seen a, a, a superstar uh, in the uh what's another culture we could talk about uh yeah, yeah. So let's talk about the South American culture, for instance, okay, right? right yeah. so let's talk about reggaeton, for example. Yeah. I expect every reggaeton artist to be from South America or to be touched with the culture. Right? I, I do not expect to see a blonde girl with blue eyes becoming a reggaeton sensation. Yeah, can, I stand, can I stand yeah. corrected? Am I, am I wrong to say that? No, I understand what you mean. Yeah. 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 So, is that, is that appropriation? It's definitely appropriate. But deeper than appropriation, it's... it's we are the only culture which can be placed in this conversation. And mm. I find that there must be a level of reluctance which we display in regards to our accessibility. We are way too accessible, you know? Even look on a higher level. So let's look on a, on a, on a politics level. It's only now that Af Africa is beginning conversations about nuclear power. In 2023, Burkina Faso is only now. Mm. Meaning that if someone really want to do this bullying thing, they can do it. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's, it's really something to comprehend in terms of how accessible we are. Right? Yeah. 
So if so, why can't why can't the you know like an African government just say, look, you know, we're going to stop the mining. Mm -hmm. You know, App Apple can no longer have our products. Mm -hmm. Um, we will mine it ourselves properly, mm -hmm. regulate it, mm -hmm. and this is the price you'll pay. Why can't they do that? So, because of the current system and how it's set, the people in charge of the operation are in bed with the enemy because the system that's developed in, on the African continent yeah. is that the, the face that are often referred to as puppets, the puppets of Africa, are um, filling up their pockets with cash. Mm -hmm. And out of survival instinct, it seems like a more viable option than standing up. Because each individual who stood up alone, we know what destiny found them, right? Mm -hmm. So this is what you're looking at. You're looking at individuals who can't stand up alone for the fact that by doing it by yourself, it's game over, right? So to regulate that system, you're, you've got no choice but to look at an African revolution. There's, there's no other ways I could put this in simple terms, mm. right? But the revolution, prior to being a physical one, if it had to be one, it would have to be a mental one first. The, my favorite quote in terms of African leaders is one from Thomas Sankara. He says that you must decolonize your mind, make it your personal mission to detach yourself with concepts and ideas which do not belong to you. It's your task. No one else's, you know? And it, this is, I think, the, the starting point for uh, a better Africa and better Africans all around the globe. Yeah. Good answer. Mm -hmm. I got you, man. <laughs> <laughs> Keep them coming, bro. <laughs> Keep them coming. What, what do you think of um, Kanye West when he said um, slavery was a choice? So when Kanye said that, he received such amounts of backlash. Mm -hmm. And I think he got completely, if not partially, misunderstood. So we live in a society where one has to be extremely precise with their words. Diplomacy can quite literally make you seem like a hero when in fact you're a villain, mm. right? Mm -hmm. and can make you seem like a villain when in fact you're a hero. So I can't speak on another man's intentions, but what I can do is depict my comprehension of that statement. I wasn't personally outraged by the understanding explored by Kanye when he says slavery was a choice, because I can separate the reality of slavery being imposed on individuals from the carrying out process of individuals conducting themselves like slaves after slavery. I've got the intellectual capacity to do that. Someone who hasn't invested as much time in perhaps understanding undertones and nuances approached by a speaker or approached by a celebrity or approached by an individual speaking on any situations might not be as able to control their emotions and also control the way in which an outrageous statement gets to make you feel. Mm -hmm. I believe that we witness outrageous statements all the time, but part of white culture or part of European culture is to practice selective outrage. So there are certain things that we're like, no, it's a no-go, you can't say that. And there's some others where it's like, that was mad, but we're gonna let it slide, mm -hmm. right? So my take on slavery was a choice is there was, individuals who co-signed, let alone the process of slavery. Uh, but then by the time slavery was abolished and by the time emancipation was found by many individuals, even though it was a fake representation of emancipation, right? It was the beginning of neo-colonialism. So another way to turn people into slaves. Individuals did not practice what Thomas Sankara is talking about in the statement that I've made earlier. Decol decolonizing yourself and your mind, you're still attached to an ideology which ultimately can only keep you to be a slave. Mm -hmm. This is what you're looking at. You're looking at a world where individuals, you know, and Kanye is a good one to touch upon. Kanye will stand in front of the camera and if he calls himself, he said it himself, he calls himself a gangster, uh, a nigger, a bitch or a hoe, everything's okay. 
but there I call myself a God. Oh my God, blasphemy, right? And the understanding of God is the highest form of consciousness possible to human consideration. Mm. This, when you say God, this is what you say. You say the almighty, the all-powerful, omnipotent, omnipresent. So Kanye saying, I identify with that is a problem and I can feel that force functioning through me and I can feel myself working alongside that force. It's a problem. But if I say, if I degrade myself in a slave manner, then it's okay. Mm. Do you see what I mean? So yeah. like I said, that statement in particular is one to understand the nuance of. If you're just going to take it for the statement that it was, of course, it's going to spark a reaction out of you. Yeah. Yeah. No, fair enough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, do you feel like being trilingual has put you at an advantage? So being trilingual has placed me in a very specific lane. Uh, I'm now about to release my project in Sango for the first time in my career. Uh, I've been so blessed with how I've been welcomed in Central Africa. All of the achievements that I've made in France and England, uh, you know, they put me on national television, on radio, wow. I performed in front of 20,000 people. Uh, I got to meet the president. I got to sit down with ministers of culture. I got to perform in schools in front of children who were reciting my lyrics in Sango and in English, performed at the biggest festivals out there. Um, I've been extremely blessed by the choice that I've made of um, working for the cause of the elevation of my people and also for bringing light upon the situations because often when you talk about the Central African Republic, it's a very miseducated conversation or misinformed conversation. Um, so it's been an honor to take on that path and it's also been a chance for me to not mix with the nonsense that I believe is occurring in the music industry, you know? Well, um, well, um, I'd say over here. In the UK. In the UK. Um, and also in France. Also in France, to be fair. When you say nonsense. And, you... and also in America. I just think the phenomenon of blackface is a huge problem for the black community. So blackface, to educate the people that don't know mm -hmm. what it is, is the... Um, fruit or the result of the racist imagination in regards to the representation of African descendants in the media world. So the very first representation of the African descendant in the media was a white man painted black going around raping white women, right? I'm sure that when I say that, those of y'all that are acquainted with the topic would know uh, what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. So that phenomenon led to today's stereotype, right? Hence the, the classification and the feds approaching me at 11 talking about you fit the profile, you match the description, right? This is where it begins. You think that came from blackface kind of stereotyping black people? 1000%. There's no doubt about it. Because like I said, blackface is the fruit and the result of the racist imagination. And that fruit and that result is now placed in the media. The media becomes everybody's reality. Everyone has a television. So everyone is programmed to an extent. You yeah. know, there's a, there's a writer and a successful capitalist called Napoleon Hill, who uh, has a book called Outwitting the Devil, right? For the sake of the exercise, I like to call it outwitting the white devil. <laughs> but let's just stick to what the book is actually called. It's called Outwitting the Devil. And in that book, Napoleon Hill speaks to a bunch of successful people uh, all across the, capital, the, the capitalism industry, mm -hmm. right? And he analyzes the way in which people have a relationship with their understanding of the devil. He explores a concept called hypnotic rhythm insinuating that as human beings we are all under the practice of hypnotic rhythm we are all hypnotized by certain concepts right so from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to bed what determines the activities that you do is what you're hypnotized by right you can only be hypnotized by something that has entered your mind the term entertainment literally means enter the mind. 
Yeah. That's literally what it means. Like governments govern the mind, right? Obviously, you've got to study etymology, understand the Latin ra- uh, roots of the terms as well. Um, but entertainment literally means to enter the mind. So if I present you an imagery which is designed to enter your mind and now bear its fruits inside of your mind, it is a specific operation which is occurring. And it's not me explaining that concept is not deep, it's plain and simple. Mm. Because at the time where blackface entered the conversation, um, African descendants were not up to those activities. Do you see what I mean? So mm-hmm. blackface misrepresents the African descendant for the sole purpose of making white people laugh, mm-hmm. right? I'm a white man, I'm going to pay myself black, act like a fool, white people are going to laugh, we've got a great show, pay-per-view and all of that, right? That's the initial purpose. Yep. But then eventually, as it grows and develops, we can now replace that individual who's being blatantly racist by an African descendant who has never seen money before, right? Because we know what the hood is like, right? So I'm going to just go in the hood, pick someone who's never seen 20 bands, and I'll present him with 200 bands and be like, why don't you go put on the dress? Hmm? Mm. You see what I mean? Mm-hmm. They've never seen 20 bands. If you've never seen 20 bands, you're now showed 200 bands to do something degrading to your people, towards your people and towards yourself. How many will have the courage and dignity to say no and choose struggle over financial or a start towards financial freedom? It's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> you see what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's all laid out for us to realize. So hence I say the blame game is not the solution. Because if I just say, no, but forget this actor, man, he put on the dress and forget this person, they did this and they did that. Okay, cool. I hear that. I definitely hear that. They've got to take accountability as well. But you've got to understand that it comes from higher than them. Mm. Hence, when you fight that issue, you've got to do it on a community level when you reinforce the minds of the individuals who are going to be presented with those temptations in the future. So it's a lot of money manipulation, right? Money manipulation and situation manipulation too. And they're, they're selling, you're saying that they're selling out um, their morals, what they believe in for, for money. Precisely. That's exactly what I'm saying. A, a good example that the other day was, um, there was a video going around with Chunks. Mm-hmm. Have you seen it? Yeah. Uh, I don't think I have, but you can educate Okay, me. right, right. So the video of Chunks, um, and they're just saying, you know, what's, what's the biggest bag you fumbled? Mm. You know, what's the biggest like, bag that you just didn't take in it? Mm. <clears throat> he, he didn't take, I think it was... It's eight hundred thousand uh-huh. pounds, um, but it was for a gambling um, company advert. advert. Yeah. Okay. I think, I think you'd have to fly out, do all this stuff, and he said no nah, because of, because of religious reasons. There we go. And then again, now he got offered two million pounds for for a single, a music single, mm-hmm. and you know that's that's a lot of money for a music single. Absolutely. You know? Some people never see that money in their life, etc., uh-huh. etc. Uh-huh. Um, he declined that as well because music's not. Um, well, it's haram, isn't it? It's haram. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So what you're looking at there is the importance of a healthy relationship mm. with a concept of integrity. And for that, I have to big up chunks on camera still. Yeah. I yeah. didn't know. And you're educating me and I'll big him up on camera for that. Because what you're demonstrating is that your relationship with integrity is more important than an idea of what financial gain could do for you mm-hmm, in terms of materialism uh, or in terms, even if, even if you took the two million and done something amazing in Africa, because that can be another argument, right? Do the gambling thing and then take the money and go build your country or something. But the fact that you're actually wanting to decline that bag is a clear indication that not only he received, he received great education, Mm-hmm. But he's now living by that education and he's also living by his faith. Yeah. And this is something that black people have to enforce your relationship with morality and integrity. Because mm. that's how they get us. I, that is the perfect example to uh, illustrate what I'm talking about. Two million is a lot of money. It's a, that's <laughs> my point. It's a lot of money. Because when I watched the video, I said, you know, why don't you just take the two million and then, you know... Go build a mosque or go do this, go do that. Mm. And then, you know, we have to look at it again as in like, you're still doing the act, aren't you? 
you're still you're taking the money, you're still making the music, 100%. even though it's, it's, it's against and, your beliefs. Yeah, and you're, you're, there's a term in America, they call it tap dancing, right? You're tap dancing for white people. Oh, okay. Right? Yeah. That's, and and I, think, I think it's a great way to, it's a great analogy to bring into the, the equation, mm. because this is what used to happen. You know, they'd, they'd have their guns, they shoot our feet and it's like, dance for me, dance for me. And, and that's what you're doing. Mm. Right, you're you're being the the entertainer for the camera. Have you, have you heard of the term coon coonery? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I have, I have, I have. It. What's what's your thoughts? Um, or what's your definition of the term? Yeah, I, I think it is what people traditionally know it to be. I, I can't reword it any other ways. It is, it is that it is someone that's um, making a fool of themselves uh, and a fool of the culture uh, and the descendants of Africa representing that culture for the sake of pleasing the oppressor, you know? And all of it is rooted in self-hate because there's, I mean, in that conversation alone, you can see the various elements that could lead someone to hating on themselves. But this, this is all rooted in self-hate, right? And it's so important, like I said, that we start with the kids, teaching them to love themselves, you mm. know? Um, I had the situation of having my niece calling me on the phone telling me that, Unks, I hate my hair, right? Which inspired one of my records called Supernatural that I'm going to put a whole vi music video for uh, and obviously release on the, on the socials. But that's the reality that we're still dealing with, right? Is they've decomposed African reality to be molded or metamorphosed, the metamorphosis of the African reality into the... Europeans' comprehension of what it should do mm. for Europe and white culture. So it's our role to be rooted in our culture and not slip. It's, it's our job, because if we don't do the job, that's how we end up with coons and that's how we end up with sellouts, right? And then at which point it's just a point the finger game because you didn't get the roots and the foundations right, you know? So, so that's definitely something to, uh, to look at closer. Well, fair enough. Um, another random question now, because um, a lot of people, there's a lot of commentary around, you know, OnlyFans and stuff like that. Mm. <clears throat> and I've heard people say, you know, but they're selling out their body or you're selling, you know, vagina pics and booby pics. Mm -hmm. You know, you're selling yourself short just for money. Mm -hmm. what's, what's your opinion on that? Is that so, to do with integrity or is that to do with something else? Or is that okay? So I found myself in the reality of driving through Tottenham with one of my big bros that yeah. I mentioned, you know, I mentioned earlier, I can call him up and that. Mm -hmm. And he's, this is my first time, because he's a, he's a full Tottenham man, right? So this is my first time getting a full tour of the notorious Tottenham, right? We know Tottenham to be notorious for what it is notorious for. And obviously he's one of the OGs there. So he's fully bringing me into London culture. I've never felt so baptized <laughs> in London culture in my whole life. Yeah. It's fully taking me around all of the corners of Tottenham. Giving you the tour, yeah? Fully, yeah. fully. Give me a full tour, bro. And uh, as I'm driving towards the high street, I kid you not, my bro, I saw a billboard as big as can be. Yeah, I know I can't. You know what I'm talking about, right? I do, yeah. You know yeah. what I'm talking about? So I can't leave my chair, but I'm going to do a... I'm going to try to do representation as big as I can do that. Like, one of the potentially the biggest size billboard uh, that you could pay for uh, in terms of size wise. It wasn't a digital one. It was a, it was a paper one. A full on billboard. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Full on billboard. Ad advertising billboard. Advertising yeah. billboard of an OnlyFans girl. I should know her name so that I could use the reference, but I don't. I can only paint the picture as far as I'm doing right now. A full billboard advertising an OnlyFans girl's Broad daylight, my friend. It was about 12 o'clock. I think she's in the kind of like bikini or in the bikini or lingerie white or something. Top. Yeah, 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 yeah. White top. So she's not, it's not full breasts out, but it's belly out, legs out. Yeah. Um, and uh, obviously, whatever facial expression she's pulling in order to, I guess, get more customers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this is the reality that we are in in 2023. Mm -hmm. And I looked at my brother and I said, Whoever's in charge of that account is basically her digital pimp, right? And he said, yeah, yeah, bro, digital pimping. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is what you're looking at in 2023. 
Mm -hmm. You're looking at children, mothers, um, community elders, religious people, non-religious people being exposed to that modern day reality of capitalism having taken such a, such a turn, such a capit capitalism being so amplified that we normalize the abnormal, such as digitally promoting nudity in exchange for money. Is it wrong? I sincerely believe that it's reflective of a dystopian time. I have to say that. Simp and, and, and I'll tell you why. Because... Yeah. And what do you mean by that? Uh, can, can you just define that for us? So yeah. that's exactly what I'll do. Uh, okay, right. The amusing, or the deeper than amusing, the, the, the amazing, let's use the amazing, the amazing aspect of human experience is to indulge in it, understanding that there is a time for everything. Mm -hmm. We are men. We know that there is a time for us to pay attention to the opposite sex. But we also know that if you devote the totality of your time, yeah, to paying attention to the opposite sex, you're likely to witness an imbalance in your life. Mm -hmm. In many different aspects. There's a time for everything. So exposing that concept to everyone in the community, especially the more fragile minds who aren't able to create separation. Because this is really what, because I understand, you know, with the, the, the liberal conversations and the people that are like, yeah, but what about sexual liberation and all of that? And like, okay, cool, bro. I understand. Everyone can hold an argument. However, there is a time for everything. Exposing more fragile minds to certain concepts too early can only have negative consequences because you are speeding up the process in which individuals ought to approach sexuality. In my opinion, there is nothing wrong with sexuality practiced properly, right? Whatever your understanding of practicing sexuality properly is, there's nothing wrong with it. But to contextualize it in a manner where you're distorting its understanding and practice, there's definitely something that reflects that there's something wrong going on. So with, with that OnlyFans billboard that we're talking about, the advertising billboard, because uh -huh. <clears throat> I saw a post where, the where she said, oh, well, I've had, you know, the neighbors complaining and stuff like that, you know, blah, blah, blah. And mm -hmm. she was almost like shocked by it. Mm -hmm. What it would look like. <laughs> That's, that is the exact point yeah. that I'm making, bro. The lack of consideration of other individuals' approach to human experience is sincerely reflective of white culture's approach to existence. So you think it's because she's white? No, I think that white culture... Oh, it's similar. I, well, I think that white culture can have you in a position where you wouldn't remotely consider the impact you are having upon other humans attempting to approach their experience of life. You promoting yourself on oh, a billboard, right. you with me? Mm -hmm. You promoting yourself on a billboard so that you make more money if you're only fans is one thing. But you failing to empathize with the individuals who are going to be impacted by that in a manner that you didn't even mean to perhaps, because clearly she's insinuating that she didn't mean that, right? Mm -hmm. Is the impact of white culture. It has you in a level of cognitive dissonance, which is unmatched. <laughs> it's unmatched. It's unmatched, bro. But would you not just say, you know, what about people saying, you know, she's just getting the bag? But that's the point that I'm making. Oh, I see. That's white, just... white culture. So you think that she's doing it inconsiderately of... Uh... Beca be because of what white culture is. White culture is get the bag, isn't it? <laughs> Reach uh, the highest fathomable level of capitalism that you can mm. at the cost of everyone else. Everyone else could die in a painful way or suffer in a painful way. As long as I'm rich, it's okay. And is that for every individual who's white or just, just no, white no, culture so as a whole? So, so, but you must understand <clears throat> that not only white people practice white culture. 
Okay, right. Do you see what I mean? Not. If you, if you give me an example, not, yeah. It's not just white people who practice white culture. So, white culture um, basically establishes the rules, i.e., couldn't some people say she's just getting the bag? That would be one of the rules placed within white culture. So, as a person of another ethnicity, you could adhere to that code of conduct. You could do whatever just to get the bag. Yeah. Do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because you answer to the normalized way in which we apply culture in Europe. You answer to white culture. Mm. Okay. You being an individual of a different ethnic background does not mean that now that aspect of code of conduct falls under the category of your culture. It doesn't mean that. Because you're the one folding yourself to the rules put in play by white culture. So you're adhering to what white culture is, which is F everything, get the bag. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I hear you, I hear you. Yeah. Um, you got a song called Soft Power, mm -hmm. which, was, which was interesting because I, I wish I remembered that before when you were talking about soft power in France and uh -huh. you know, that's, that's the way they use it, right? Uh -huh. <clears throat> And in that song, you said, would you even have that privilege if you weren't Caucasian? Mm -hmm. what, what do you mean by that? <laughs> you can just explain that for us. So to break down the lyric yeah. um, is limitation. Wait, cause, cause I, made, I made the record quite a while back. I am. Um, limitation witness due to nature of education. Would you ever feel some privilege if you wasn't born Caucasian? That remains the question unanswered by education, mm. right? Would you ever feel some privilege if you wasn't born Caucasian? That remains the question unanswered by education. Um, and what I meant by that is as education is presented to the African descendant under the application of soft power. Yep. <clears throat> The experience that the Africans witnessed is always one of degradation. So you're, you're always degraded. You're, uh, you're, you're colonized. You're a slave. You're, right? So there isn't a perception of your human experience from supreme and divine is you start on minus levels. That's how your self-esteem begins. Hence, a lot of people until today do not rise out of the state of developing a sense of self-esteem which reflects supreme. A lot of people function under the heavy weight of insecurity. They literally function in accordance to insecurity, which by design can only turn you into a faithful consumer. That's all you can do. Because you're insecure, you're gonna to turn to food. Because you're insecure, you're gonna to turn to consumption of alcohol. You're going to turn to consumption of drugs. You're going to turn to gambling. You're going to turn to pursuit after countless amounts of, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because you're insecure. Mm -hmm. Remove the insecure element out of it and replace that with supreme. You'll find that you do not need anything. You don't need anything because you feel complete. <laughs> is, it, is it a mental thing? It's definitely a mental thing. Okay, right. Hence, when we talk about entertainment, Hence, when we talk about um, <coughs> manipulation, these are the things to consider. Elements can be placed in your mind to distort your destiny. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So, yeah, that's really what I'm exploring with soft power. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, let me quote another song. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, Starlight mm -hmm. song. Glorifying the drug dealers and killers, we be endearing them. Mm -hmm. Correcting criminals in the world that's engineering them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I told you I do my research. I love it, bro. That's journalism. I love it, bro. I love someone that can do that job because <laughs> it makes mine easier. <laughs> oh, fair enough. Yeah. Can you can you explain that one for us? What, what do you yeah. mean by that? So I believe I touched upon it a little bit earlier as well. Yeah. Glorified the drug dealers and killers. Mm -hmm. So we know in Christianity that. Jesus, I'm not a Christian, by the way, but it's a great example to bring to the forefront. Jesus, who is the individual uh, that marks our 
quantifying of time in today's society. So when you and I say, I'm born in 94, you're born in 93, yep. you could give the month, date and seconds, you are measuring that time in accordance to Jesus's death. That's mm -hmm. what you're doing. Yep. So Jesus, prior to dying, was placed next to an individual called Barabbas. Barabbas was known to be a stone cold killer. And Pontius Pilate, who represents the Roman Empire, after hearing the story of Jesus, who was accused by his brothers and sisters of being someone, you know, being a blasphemous person claiming to be the son of God and blah, 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 blah. We want him dead. Uh, Pontius Pilate, after hearing the story of Jesus said, no, this man sounds completely innocent, mm -hmm. right? Which again shows you the beginning of white culture really, because with the power that he had, he could have set Jesus free on the back of realizing that he was innocent. But what did he do? He brought Barabbas, the stone cold killer, yeah. and presented both men to the crowd. You've got a stone cold killer and you've got a Messiah. We all know who they chose, right? Yep. So today you're looking at the same thing. Glorify the drug dealers and killers will be endearing them. We endear the drug dealers and killers. We place them in a position that's heroic. We turn them into our new idols. We change our names with theirs. Or call me Mike Capone. Call me Nino Mikes or Nino Jules. Right? Because we've all seen the gangster films that sparked a little sum in us, right? So we name ourselves after them, right? Just the way that, you know, you get those colonial names placed upon ex-African descendants. Now you've got black people with white names. Now black people out of their own will endear the gangster. We place them in a position of, yeah. Do you feel me? I do, yeah. I'm, <laughs> right? I'm sorry you're saying, yeah. And, and then when I say in the world that's correcting criminals, in the world that's engineering them, that's the conversation that I had with that judge. By the way, big up Marilyn. If you're seeing this interview, big up. Set man free with that one still. Um, <laughs> yeah, man had the chat with Marilyn, you get me? And she, she made it clear to me that our world is engineering criminals. But she also said, what, what did she say? That it's, um, she understands why. She understands why. <clears throat> why wouldn't people turn to crime? And what was her reason for understanding that? So, because she's obviously dealt with the big wigs, right? And she's dealt with the people then in the system. So the layer of complexities of the stories that she's been exposed to, uh, she, she's seen both sides, both sides of the argument. So I've seen what happens uh, in accordance to the law that's written. And I've seen the messed up amount of scenarios that people have been in uh, that has led them to make certain choices. And on the back of putting the whole thing into correlation, right? Deprived environment, lack of positive distractions, right? The, the thing that I mentioned at the start, positive distractions. Um, that's going to lead you to a position where, why wouldn't I make the wrong choice? My back's against the wall right now, you know? And, and as a judge that has served for such a long time, she understood that. So it's a kind of like a, ne a necessity to live, right? A necessity to, so, or, or a necessity to seek for a better life. Kind I'll, of like the immigrant right. conversation. I'm going to leave my soil to look for something better. Yep. It's survival. I That's what mean. it is, bro. It's survival surrounded by a bunch of individuals who create an environment that's overly hostile and normalizes wrong decisions. Yeah. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. um, how, does multi, how does your multicultural background um, influence your, your music? I think it's apparent that I am a very passionate individual about life and humans in general. Um, and I just actualize the ideas that I have mm. in regards to what I believe human experience should be. You know, it's one thing to have thoughts and it's another to turn these thoughts into actions. And my music has demonstrated to me that it has the power to alter reality. It's proven it to me. You know, it's a concept that starts in my mind, then I put it out and then my life, by a click of a finger, everything happens. Television, newspapers, Netflix, Amazon, 
all of these things. Possibility happens when I allow the music to come out of me. So um, I'm extremely privileged to have been exposed to so much. I've spent time with the one percenters, like billionaires, and I've spent time with poor people in the third world. So all across that spectrum, I have experience with humans. Yep. And I know that what we think we know is limited to what we've been exposed to. So I will forever encourage my listener to root themselves in education. Mm. Education will set you free. That's a fact. Mm. It's the closest thing to freedom under the conditions we're witnessing now one could ever experience because it allows someone to kind of get uh, that eagle slash falcon view over a situation. The falcon is the animal that can uh, fly the highest in the sky and perceive the furthest. So this is kind of the tool that you have to equip yourself with. Look at situations like a falcon, like an eagle, as opposed to looking at them, you know, <laughs> yeah. No, I understand. Yeah. Um, have you ever doubted your your identity, your kind of culture, mm. and who you are? Have you ever have you ever had a no, time to doubt job, it? Bro, you're asking some <laughs> questions. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. We like that. Um, so I found myself in certain realities where I didn't personally doubt, but I've been tested. Okay. What do you mean? So I've been in a situation where a white woman said to me, Nels, you're black. You're not African. Wow. You with me? Okay. And I had, as I digested that, immediately I was like, wow. So I can actually be in such close proximity to cognitive dissonance. Like, I can, like, my reality means that I'm now in a situation where my physical science can be determined by, or a, there can be an attempt of determining my physical science. Mm. Because scientifically, there is no doubt that I'm an African. I should never have to justify nor explain myself. But I can be placed in a scenario where someone will attempt to do that. So was I not rooted in my own sense of self and education, I could have folded. I could have said, yes, you're right. I am black and not an African. I could have said that, right? Mm. But I didn't because I'm rooted in a, an understanding of who I am. So she tried to separate the... She tried to separate the both. Identity from... Which, yeah. which, is what, which is a reality lived by many people. Mm. Many people identify more with blackness than Africa, don't they? or a concept of blackness, or even a distorted concept of blackness, simply because they're not rooted in the full understanding of what it means to be an African. Right, right. Mm -hmm. I've seen a post with you and Russell Brand. Mm -hmm. um, is that someone you, you know, you've worked with? How, yeah. how did that come about? Yeah, so, yeah, Russell has, uh, at least over the last two years, is someone, uh, myself and my comrade, JJ the Great, um, have worked with yeah. uh, closely. You know, we, we wrote a book and we produced... So who wrote a book? Uh, myself and JJ. Oh, right, right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I write books sometimes. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we wrote a book uh, yeah. and produced a soundtrack to his um, tour, mm. uh, which, which was called the 33 tour, right? A tour where he explored the realities of COVID, uh, talked a bit about his family, uh, and some of the, some other political things that had gone on in the UK. Is it like a comedy tour? Or? It's a, com it's okay, a comedy right, tour, a comedy, because that's where he's predominant, pre it's predominantly a comedian. Yeah. You know, at least nowadays. Um, as well as obviously doing the platform and the podcast. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so we are individuals who have made our stance very clear 
about where we stand in regards to the system and in regards to so-called reality. And we use education as a tool to liberate people. Mm -hmm. And my brother JJ said to me that he believes that Russell was someone who's down for the cause, right? Okay. I had studied Russell in the past before, even mentioned him in the lyric that to the world has not seen the light just yet because it's a record in my thousands of songs on my computer, right? Which I've just not released. It's a really good record. I've performed it, but I've just not released it. Mm. Um, so I knew that as far as I'm concerned, Russell was also someone fighting for freedom. Freedom for humans, you know, and humans not being commodities and treated like, you know, animals. Um, and on the back of that, we, as I said, wrote a book and produced a soundtrack to his comedy tour, which mm -hmm. is a track that I produced, my production. The lyrics were written by JJ. We learned it, rehearsed them, nice. got our faithful cameraman, Mr. OSM, <laughs> yeah? To pattern the visual for us. Shout out Oda. Shout out Oda. Every <laughs> time, it has to be done. Um, and yeah, so we now had a full product to present to Russell. Book, video, website, CD. And Russell, when we brought that to him at one of the shows, right? Um, he was very impressed with our tenacity and capacity to hold ourselves professionally to such a standard. As in Dunstable. Uh, yeah, so Dunstable is, yeah, that's, wow. I'm sorry, Mr. Journalist. I'm sorry, yeah? <laughs> he knows everything. <laughs> yeah, so when we got to Dunstable now and yep. present him with all of that work, not only is he impressed, but he, he now makes the connection between us and his team. And uh, this is how the journey kind of begun. Then, because we wasn't hearing much from his team, JJ and I had decided to persist in the, um, the pursuit of our collaboration with Russell. Yeah. Right. And uh, we turned up in Nottingham and I don't know where spirit was in the air, but he said, OK, cool. Two microphones, stage, you man, do your thing. So after this performance uh, in Nottingham, we jumped on stage and done what we had rehearsed all of these weeks to do. Oh, so it wasn't planned. It wasn't planned. Wow. And we completely shut it down, took pictures, took videos, put us on his Instagram, nice. right? Uh, God knows how many followers and interaction that we had on the back of that move. He then took the MP3 that I produced at MLN Studio, uh, placed it as a soundtrack behind visuals that he had filmed of his Hammersmith uh, Apollo performance, uh, which is a video that has like half a million views and plays on Instagram. Uh, further solidifying our collaboration with him. And then as if that wasn't enough, he then put us on at his community festival that happened two years ago for the first time. Nice. Right? So this is when the collaboration was now solidified to the extent whereby after shutting it down the first time, he then re-invited us to perform at a community festival which just happened this year on the 24th of July, I believe. Nice. Or nice. 14th, I read the 14th or 24th of July. What, what kind of happens at these community festivals? So at the community festival, like the name indicates, the aim is to create a community. Yep. A sense of togetherness, which occurs from a sober headspace. So it's a non-alcohol uh, festival where you have music performances, you have uh, talks about various topics such as masculinity, uh, such as uh, an understanding of how to embody your uh, yourself, uh, or deeper than that, how to embody what you believe in, right? Yeah. So you might have guided meditations, you might have uh, explanations of how spirituality functions, people might be sharing personal experiences, you've got uh, loads of people basically camping so like 5,000 people wow. uh, coming from all types of background, all types of beliefs, uh, just seeking for a community, right? And you've got performances, uh, obviously from rap music, myself and JJ, yeah. to someone playing the harp or something, or like just loads of different stuff, right? Just a bunch of individuals trying to create uh, 
multicultural community. That's how I would describe. The That's interesting, one. yeah. Yeah. Because I saw him actually do a post on his Instagram, which is quite big, uh -huh. with you guys. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and the caption was, you know, the revelation, the revolution is here. It starts within us. One hundred. What, what did you kind of mean by that? What, what's your take on that? So, like I said, yeah, the, the very first thing that we have to do as people, prior to even pointing the finger and blaming X, Y, and Z, we have to take charge of our thinking. I find that as people, this is where we got lost in the mix. Mm. We, we allow influence to become our, almost like our God, you know? The, if you actually look at the definition of influence, it's a very negative term. You know, if I say you're driving under the influence, it means that you drunk too much and you're not, you shouldn't be in a position where you're driving, right? If I say you're easily influenceable, it means that you do not have enough of a strong mind to say no to people sometimes, right? If I say that uh, you was influenced by the media, it means that someone can change the way in which you would normally react or act, right? So the term influence is actually a very negative movement, but now we've got profession, professions made out of that term. We've got influences as if it was a positive thing. So it's like we are in a day and age where you can be swayed in directions that do not reflect your, uh, your initial thought process or your initial way of thinking, right? So when we say the revolution starts within us, back to what I was saying about T. Sankara earlier, you've got to remove any ideologies which do not belong to you. Otherwise, your human experience can only reflect uh, an experience of someone that's controlled by other people. You know, so prior to us even getting into detail about how humans are going to rise up, we've got to start there. Take charge of your thinking. All right, right. Mm -hmm. um, do, you, do you watch Russell Brand's kind of stuff? I know he's got quite a lot of uh, YouTube following now as well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he's kind of, it looks like he's exposing quite a lot. Absolutely. Because uh, obviously he is in the public eye. He yeah. might know a bit more than we do. I'm not too sure. Mm hmm. Um, but he's, yeah, he's got a following for that. So look, mm. it almost looks like conspiracy theories and stuff mm. like that. Mm. What's, what's your take on this, on this, that kind of content? So we are in a, in the age of information, meaning that I believe that each and every one of us should take pride in how much they handle information. Yeah. You're never to be placed in a situation where you take someone's word for gospel. You should always do the required work, yeah? That's necessary for you to take information, compare it to the knowledge that you currently have and do further research if need be. But I believe that on the platform that Russell has had, he has brought a set of informations which can be challenged and questioned and most importantly researched by individuals. So my message is for people to do the work. Don't just assume that because it comes from Russell or because it comes from this person, then we can trust it. Do the work and actually find out what is being spoken of and find out who is benefiting out of the stuff that Russell is touching upon. All right, so we ask everyone, um, what inspires you like mm. in life? Um, Humans. Humans inspire me. Okay, right, right, right. Mm -hmm. So just everyday humans. And life in general. Mm. I live by a concept called joy of life. I just, I'm just always happy. <laughs> <laughs> You're lucky. <laughs> yeah. do, you, do you believe in any conspiracy theories? So I don't think that you can call it a conspiracy theory if it can be proven. And okay, many right. things have been proven. For example? So, um, so, for example, we've had many individuals coming back from African countries talking about how AIDS and HIV were planted in the population, right? Mm. So these, these are things to consider uh, when it comes to the world of the, you know, quick jabs and that. <laughs> I'm talking boxing. <laughs> so, um, yeah, there's, there's many situations that people 
want to cast out because it doesn't benefit the capitalist in charge. Mm. But I believe that all of us ought to do the work. Don't just live your life based off misinformation or disinformation. Do the work that's necessary. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. Have you heard of the flat earth theory? I've heard about that. Do you, do you have any beliefs on that? So or do I've, you think it's round? So I've not done the research, so okay, I can't I see. speak on it. But I've, I've heard about it, for sure. 